Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about pricing merchants uh, and how that merchant pricing uh, interaction works, different ways to think about the components of pricing, uh, who are the players, how do you break down the fees, um, we'll go here. So, oh yeah, that's about me. You don't need to, not a big thing. Um, so we'll talk about who's involved. We'll talk about um, what are the components. Uh, there's four components to the fees that are made up. Uh, the famous question from non-payments people, what is it, what the heck is a basis point? And what is that, how does that matter to me? Um, and then getting really into different models that you'll see out there. Um, interchange plus, flat rate pricing, tiered pricing. And we'll go through some examples that are uh, some geeky math uh, equations about how pricing works. As uh, Tu said, definitely ask your questions when you feel like them. If, uh, if possible, I'll answer them right away and or at least work it in as quickly as possible. So definitely prefer that. And you can ask your questions by um, raising your hand, two will uh, hopefully be paying attention if I get off on a ramble. She'll be paying attention and uh, make sure to give you airtime or I'll try and figure out how to do it. Um, and uh, and you can also just type questions in and we will uh, we will definitely answer them as soon as we can. All right, so who is who in payments? We often call it the four-party model, which is funny because there are five, five categories here. If you think about it, you... You share your uh, the presentation. Oh, <laughs> that would help, wouldn't it? Okay. Can you see it? Yep. Very right, good. Thank you. All right. So uh, I could see everything. So I thought it was fine. Um, so the the four party model. If you think about the who's who of payments, um, think about you've got a card holder and you've got an, a merchant. And the requirement in the US market is every single transaction must have a bank on each side. So you've got the cardholder who's re relying on an issuing bank and a merchant who's relying on a, an acquiring bank. And so that's, and, and in between of course, is the, is the card network. And so, that four-party model has evolved over time where you have some players sort of sitting in the in those roles or, or underneath those roles with payment processors. So these are the entities that take transaction data and sends them to the card network. And they take uh, uh, the uh, money and they arrange for the money to get to the acquiring bank. Um, so that the the card networks are, of course, a critical player, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover in the U.S. markets. Um, and they work with the acquiring banks, typically, and the issuing banks. But the payment processors are often the ones doing some of the dirty work. And then the merchant acquirers and embedded payment providers, if you think about it, if you have to have an acquiring bank, and there's a processor in there somewhere. They might be owned by the acquiring bank. In the example of JP Morgan uh, Chase, they own a processor that's uh, been called Payment Tech, uh, but there's still that processor in the mix. Stripe built their own processing capabilities ad, as uh, Adyen has as well, but in there that function is necessary. The key and where the magic happens in, in my view is Number five, the merchant acquires and embedded payment providers. What that means is they're taking all of this product, the banking sponsorship, the payment processing, and what the networks have put together, and they're adding margin to that. Uh, and that's where the, the majority of the money is made on the acceptance side of the equation. So let's go. Some of this may be very remedial. I see a lot of names on here of people who probably know more than me about this part. So I'll just go back over it for those of you who don't, and uh, we'll get a little more into the guts of price. So when you go to use your card at the merchant, that card is authorized. By authorizing, they go. the merchant uses a payment facilitator or marketplace or maybe an ISO to check with the, the processor to see if the card's any good. Very often there's a gateway in there um, connecting the payment facilitator with the, with the processor. 
And so as that happens, the authorization happens, the processor checks with Visa, Visa checks with the issuer and gives an approve or decline. Once it's approved, the transaction is held in the, uh, it's held at the processor or at the gateway. And at the end of the day, all those transactions are sent in. They get sent to the card networks and the card networks each organize uh, data files to go to the processor and money to go uh, to the acquiring bank. So that's, that's how the transactions get settled. Usually they get settled overnight. And then the acquiring bank and the processor work to get the money to the payment facilitator who decides how much to pay the merchant. If there's any questions about it, feel free to ask. So now let's break down a $100 transaction. And let's just assume for a moment that uh, that transaction is happening uh, at, the, at a, uh, let's say it's at a restaurant. There's four parts to what make up that transaction. The first part is interchange. Interchange, and this is not, not everyone knows this. In fact, it's usually assumed otherwise, but interchange is money that is revenue for the issuing bank. So the card networks determine the amounts of interchange and there's a number of things that go into it, but the money ultimately goes to the issuing bank. And let's see, there's a question from Sean Clancy. Will we be able to see a, a, receive a copy too? I don't know. Are we? Are, do we send out a, the slides afterward? Um, yes, we'll have a, a PDF uh, of the slides that will go with the cool. presentation. Thank you. Okay. So if you think about it, the lion's share of this goes to the, goes to the issuing bank. So if you've got a card that say that's a, that's a Chase United card like I use, um, the the majority of the money from that transaction goes to Chase. The second component, I'm gonna actually go out of order here. I'll just put them all up here. The second component, working backwards from the issuer, the second component is the network fees, and that is actually, and a lot of people think interchange is money made by Visa or MasterCard. Network fees are actually where their revenue comes from. So there's, in this transaction, on 100 bucks, there might be about 15 cents that goes to uh, the network fees. Then uh, the processing cost, we talked a little bit before about the processor, that uh, the processor, the acquiring bank, who are sponsoring the, the uh, payment facilitator or embedded payments player, they might get a total of something like 20 cents. That might be a bit rich for them, but that's that's something you'd see. And then the remainder, that $1.45 is margin for that payments company. And I think in this example, let me do my math here. Let's see, three, four, five, uh, three, six, five, uh, three, seven, five, three, eight. So it, this, this example that we gave was three, we didn't put it on the slide, but it was 3.5% and 30 cents to make up these numbers. So on a hundred dollar transaction, 3.5% is $3 and 50 cents and the 30 cents gets added on. And that's a total of $3 and 80 cents. So you can see where that money is shared among the players. Let's see if there's another question. Could the margin vary based on GPV? So GPV stands for gross processing volume. And when, when companies are pricing merchants, whether they be a payment facilitator or processor or whomever, typically the more volume, just like a lot of industries, the more volume that's done, the lower the margin's likely to be uh, on each of it, but the, to the total amount, the total amount of money made tends to be higher. So yes, often that um, that pricing goes down the larger the merchant is. Okay, so if you think as we just lay out kind of the, uh, the basics of the four things, right? Interchange, network fees, processing costs, and margin, in order to figure out how this pricing works, the thing that I, I hear the most from non-payments people is what is this basis point stuff? And a lot of financial uh, financial services people, analysts, uh, people in the stock market world are used to it, but it's really it's really quite quite simple. So uh, a basis point is the same thing as a hundredth of a percent or 0.01 percent, 
which is the same thing as 0. 0.0001 times whatever the amount of the transaction is. Those are all the same, and you can go back and forth between those representations of a basis point or a hundredth of a percent. So on a $100 transaction, one basis point is one cent. How do you get to that? Well, $100 times 0. 0.0001 is a penny. $100 times 0.01% is a penny. So all three of those are the exact same equation. And that's really where we get this idea of a basis point. So now, one of the important things, excuse me, one of the important things that you'll find in uh, managing pricing in the world of, of payments is you're going to hear it expressed in percentages. You might hear it expressed in a, a transaction fee. This is like if it's 3.8% or it's $3.80. But the most common you're going to see is some of each. You're going to see 3.5% and 30 cents. And what ends up happening is you've got to be able to go back and forth between the percentage and the dollar amount on a transaction so that you can get everything into common terms to figure out which one's more expensive. And the, the equation to go from percentage rate to a per transaction fee is you just multiply that percent times the size of the transaction. So on a $100 transaction, if it's 3.5%, that's $3.50. 3.50% times 100 is 350, it's below. So that's pretty straightforward. What gets a little harder to do in your head is if you've got a per transaction fee, let's say you've got that 30 cents, what the 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 uh, thing to put on the sticky note by your laptop is take the per transaction fee divided by the size of the transaction or the average ticket if you're going across many transactions. It's the per transaction fee divided by the transaction size. And what you end up with is the percent. So on a hundred dollar transaction, it's easy because what it it goes back and forth with the same number. But on a hundred dollar transaction, thirty cents divided by a hundred dollars is 0 0.30 percent. All right, I don't see any questions, so I'm going to move on. If there are questions, by all means, ask them. So now we've talked about the components to the transaction. I'll repeat it, interchange, network fees, processing costs, and margin. Now we've talked about how these um, amounts are expressed. Is it a percentage? Is it a per transaction? Or is it both? And how do you move back and forth between them? Now I want to talk a little bit about how this pricing is expressed to merchants and some of the pros and cons of these pricing models. So one thing you hear a lot about is Interchange Plus. And Interchange Plus, we should spend a little bit of time on what how Interchange is determined for each transaction. The way Interchange is determined for each transaction starts with what kind of merchant is it? Because that's usually pretty consistent. If you're a car dealer, you're a car dealer. If you're a plumber, you're a plumber. So what kind of merchant is it? Second, what kind of card is it? Is it a debit card, a credit card? Is it a business card or a consumer card? Is it a rewards card, a super rewards card? Is it um, international? Is it US, et cetera? The third thing is, how is that card data being captured? Is it being typed in over on the, on the other side of the internet where the card holders typing it in themselves? Is it being tapped? Is it phone called in, we used to call mail order, telephone order transactions. So the way that the transaction is captured is really important. And really what's most important with that is, is the card or the person present or is it not present and it's remote? And that has a lot to do with risk and also different, uh, different uh, pricing. And then lastly, uh, very often there's data being shared um, along with the card information. That data might be um, an invoice number. Uh, if you're taking a, a, a card uh, that's not present, uh, very often you need an invoice number if you want the best interchange. You might want to get that CVV number on the back. Um, if it's a business card, there's certain requirements to get the best rates to 
put tax information or line item information. So those data elements determine the interchange rate. And because it's so complicated, there are over a thousand interchange rates just in the US market. In order to make sure that you are um, covering the costs as a, as a provider, whether you're a, a pay fac or what, you have to make sure if you're going to do a flat rate, you have to make sure that you cover the cost of all the transactions, or you have to strategically lose on very few transactions and not have, have a merchant find a way to get below cost on you. So because of that, flat rates really evolved as interchange started becoming much more widespread or many more kinds of interchange, many more interchange levels, Interchange Plus was born. And uh, I'll, I'll get to uh, looking at the question in just a sec as I finish the thought on Interchange Plus. The idea of Interchange Plus is whatever the cost of that card is, is passed along. Whatever is usually Interchange Plus is really Interchange Plus Plus, meaning it's Interchange Plus network fees plus something, um, which is which is the 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 um, after the plus, but it's very often a, a very different transaction by transaction because there's so many different types of cards that can come in and so many different, there's card present, card not present in different data. All right, let's take a look. Um, I, I got this question last time too. Any thoughts about on the legislation moving through Congress to cut the interchange fees? I think we learned pretty convincingly that uh, price fixing doesn't work very well and it has unintended consequences. Um, when debit prices were were fixed, uh, regulated in 2011, uh, the way they were regulated surprised a lot of people and was really good for Walmart, um, wasn't so good for McDonald's. Uh, and a lot of weird things start happening. You, you found that really the merchant acquiring industry made a lot of money um, from the differential pricing in debit, where uh, it hasn't been that great to small business, uh, in my opinion, uh, but it's been a great windfall to really big, big box stores. Um, so I there's, there's a number of things going through Congress, but I generally think uh, the interchange that is paid is well worth it uh, and creating lots of new industries uh, that wouldn't exist without the innovation that the card networks have uh, put into the market. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay, so if you look on the left, the, the dark red bars are the costs. And if you see the, the margin on top of the cost is consistent. So the cost of the transaction, the total cost of the transaction, including margin, is different on every transaction. But the amount of margin being made, the actual net revenue for the uh, provider is consistent. And so it's it's got pros and cons. And we'll come back to what's better or worse about that. With flat rate, it's all consistent. The, the example would be 3.5% and 30 cents. All flat, there's different transaction costs and the margin is, is the pink and it's the di different margin on different transactions. And we'll get into more of the pros and cons, but where that can be a little tricky is uh, every six months when rates change, the interchange rates, not only are there th over a thousand of them, but they changed on average, typically twice a year in October and in April. And, uh, and, and when those change, one has to predict what that's going to mean uh, if, if one's at a flat rate because you don't want to end up underwater. The third one, and uh, this will get some good conversation, I think, is tiered pricing. And the idea of tiered pricing, pricing is you group interchange levels into kind of like amounts in defined ways. For example, you might have your qualified tier or your, your, your least expensive tier of pricing, that might be debit cards. Maybe it's consumer credit cards when the card is present. Um, and then your mid qualification might be card not present. Maybe it's some rewards cards, even when the card is present, uh, but probably not too many business cards, if any. And then the, the non-qualified would be kind of these most expensive cards, the super premium rewards. If you don't have a card present and it's uh, there's data missing, things like that. And it looks like there's another question. Why do interchange rates change every year and who changes them? Okay, so I don't know if, if someone's giving me like softballs. This is great. Um, so interchange levels uh, are 
the way that card networks, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, discover in the U.S. market. And for those of you who may not have been at the beginning, this is a very U.S. market focused presentation. So uh, you cannot apply a lot of this uh, outside the U.S. market. Um, most markets have far fewer interchange levels and the pricing is different. Um, so the interchange is set by those networks who compete with each other for issuers. So the issuers, if you think about the issuers, the issuers are banks of all sizes. And they decide, do I want to put a MasterCard on the front of my card? Do I want to put a Visa in front of my card? And if you remember me saying that interchange is revenue for the um, for the card networks, uh, sorry, for the, not the card networks, for the uh, ban issuing banks, then the more the card networks can set interchange, the higher they set them, the higher the uh, margin for the issuers or the higher the revenue for the issuers. So there's an incentive for the card networks to raise interchange as high as possible. However, if it gets raised too high, then merchants won't accept it. So this is a dance that they've been play, uh, playing for a long time. One of the ways they do it is to give what might ironically be uh, thought of as an incentive for lower interchange when they want to drive business on the merchant side and an increase when they want to drive uh, their, their, their market share on the issuing side. So where you get all these different interchange levels is you've got, let for example, charities, Visa put a, a, a uh, incentive, I guess you call it, for the, the nonprofit industry and lowered interchange for that industry. But they don't want to give that incentive to an industry they're not trying to lower. So one of the spring and fall release, one of the April and October times, they created that new interchange level and changed pricing. Sometimes they raise pricing, sometimes they even lower pricing, but they have this set, this condition set to be twice a year. And the processors need to make a lot of tech changes. The banks have to be ready. All of the documentation has to be updated. So it's it's been, I think, a win-win a around the industry to have you know just a couple times a year trying to do it. Um, anyway, the the question was why do the interchange rates change every year and who changes them? And just to repeat, the card networks set interchange, but interchange is received uh, by the uh, issuing bank or the revenues received. I got a new question just when I'm looking at the Q&A. How do you ensure slash suggest managing transparency to tiered pricing? So that's a great question. One of the um, cons, so there's pros and cons of all of this. And I'm going to get to this as I go to each one. But one of the cons of tiered pricing is, is it can be, it can lack transparency. Um, and, and what that means is, well, one provider could bucket a, um, a consumer credit card that is card not present into um, mid qualified and another one could put it into non-qualified. Um, and so managing transparency, the best way I think of it, Ali, is if you, if you make it very clear on how you define the three tiers. Um, just not just qualified, non-qualified, mid, but hey, all your debit cards are going to be here, your basic credit cards here, all your um, credit cards that go up to you know normal rewards are going to be here uh, unless they're card present when they'll go to non. And you just define all that. And I think the more it can be simplified and defined for the merchant, uh, the more transparent it will be. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, I believe Joe Fuster raised his hand. I don't know how to, um, do you know uh, uh, how to? I'm trying to see where the raised hand was, sorry. Oh, it's Joe. I think I figured oh, it out. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, Joe, go for it. Do the issuing banks exert any pressure on the interchange rate change? Otherwise, if it's universally the same, how do they compete differently? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but let me let me see if I can ask if I can clarify and ask. So, the issuing banks exert pressure all the time to their networks. Right. to give them more interchange. And mm -hmm. they the it's not usually so much about whether it's in spring or fall or they don't really have a lot of voice there. 
It's just, we want to make more interchange and here's something we noticed, you know, about where interchange is lacking or this or that. The counter problem is that merchants are really hate interchange and want to keep it lower. Did, okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So I'm just thinking if you issue and I issue and I lobby for lower interchange and the network agrees or higher interchange, it affects you equally, correct? Yes, I mean, it does. Okay. That's really yes, it does. All issue, And that's part of why it is the Supreme Court in the 80s said it's not antitrust. It's not an antitrust violation because it is the network is keeping the control of pricing away from the issuers and the issue the networks are competing with each other for issuers so they ruled in a landmark case in the 80s that it was not an antitrust violation Thanks. okay i believe peter craddock had his yeah. hand up yeah hi sorry about that i i was just looking at the hand up icon and i clicked on it so okay i do have one question for you though about um so take some of the banks are now issuing some of the big money center banks or large regional banks are issuing uh, credit cards that have 2% uh, or higher in terms of cash back on purchases. Mm -hmm. How do they pay for that? Is the, is the consumer actually paying for it through higher fees that they're not seeing? Uh, or does that come out of the bank's bottom line? The, the the argument that the merchants, the, the large merchants often make is that uh, the consumers are paying for the for that interchange? The counter argument, and I'm not an I'm not a lobbyist or an expert. The counter argument is: look, some people want uh, cash rewards, some people want travel rewards. Those rewards make the consumer happy and make the consumer use the most uh, efficient way of paying, which you know they would argue is credit and debit cards, or particularly credit cards. So right. it's 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 very complicated. It's very political. Uh, you would you would this this individual would argue that uh, it it feeds innovation, it feeds usage, it feeds driving new use cases like Apple Pay, you know the Uber experience with Card Not Present, and you know lots of other things that are happening only get fueled because there's innovation in electronic payments. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's go a little deeper on the models. So with Interchange Plus, the positives are you app, oh my gosh, there's a lot of, I have to hit the button a lot of times for this build. I'll just get them all out there. Um, so the first thing is it's completely transparent. Um, the, the, you see exactly what the Interchange, um, each and every transaction should be available on, here's how much it costs. Um, it's very fair. Uh, and so you you have a consistent margin, which is nice for the uh, provider, and you have a, uh, a a knowledge that you're paying the best price um, with your negotiated amount over interchange. You're always getting that, provided you uh, your processor gets the the data across to the card networks with all the right stuff in it. You should be very consistent in terms of how much margin you're paying for as a merchant. The problems are. If you're a merchant, you're you have a mess of a statement. It is it is so ugly, and you cannot predict the costs. You know, on a transaction by transaction basis, or really on any basis, you just know that whatever it is, it's fair. With one caveat, um, there are quite a few examples that we've seen where the provider marked up interchange, so they claimed it's interchange plus, but then they added hidden margin in there. Uh, I'd argue that's fraud, but it's done out there uh, by players large and small. And that's something just to spot check here and there to make sure you're not getting screwed. Um, that's but but interchange plus, it's hard to argue too much with. But if you look at satisfaction, a lot of merchants really love just a nice, simple pricing. And that brings us to the flat rate. So think of the flat rate as you know, 3.5% and uh, and 30 cents. Um, it's really easy to understand. Uh, the merchants know, hey, if I did it, you know, if I did $100,000, I know that I'm paying whatever, $3,500 um, for my fees uh, in a given month. Um, the other pro uh, is if you can, if you can make sure if you're as a provider, the pros and cons here are 
largely from the position of the seller of these of of this service. Um, if you optimize your payment, uh, uh, your interchange, if you optimize how you're processing payments, you can minimize the dark red bars. And by minimizing that, you're increasing the amount of margin that goes to you as opposed to going to the merchant. Um, a lot of times there's some fancy stuff that can be done, whether it's uh, technology called network tokens or uh, 3D secure, which is about uh, authenticating the payer or just uh, sending more data on business card transactions. There are ways that a provider can get uh, a lower interchange by doing something that may be unusual or, or, or very positive, uh, and they get all the benefit. The negative on flat rate is it's almost always going to be more expensive. Um, that and that's the trade-off. Merchants love the simplicity, uh, and they're trading, you know, the the absolute best price for a simple, predictable uh, statement. And then um, another con from the perspective of the provider is. Every time those rates change twice a year, and keep in mind, you've got a thousand different levels, hugely complicated uh, criteria to qualify for different interchange levels. Uh, you have to really be on your game on, on a, uh, what, what I like to call portfolio management, um, which is looking at all your merchants and are they underpriced? Are there transaction categories that are that are um, coming in too low? Are we overall assuming interchange at the wrong level now that the new uh, numbers came out. So that's really important with a, a flat model. And then let's get into tiered. So uh, let's get all these. Okay. So another thing that's positive about tiered is pretty easy to understand. You're either paying, you know, rate A, rate B, or rate C. So maybe I'm paying, you know, 2.5% and 30 cents for my qualified and 2.9 plus 30 cents for my mid qualified and 3.5. And I'm probably putting examples that are too low, but you see what I'm saying. So it's really under, easy to understand how much of my transactions were qualified, how much were mid-qualified, how much were non-qualified. Um, and this is a, a place where there's a lot of opportunity for the provider to enhance margin um, by just really focusing on interchange optimization and thinking through what that bucketing is. Um, and bucketing is the name for how do you group things? How do you group interchange levels into the, those three tiers? If there's a thousand interchange levels and there's 200 in the first tier and 400 in the second tier and another 400 in the third tier, which ones and how transparent are, are you with how you set that up? What's negative about it is usually this is going to be more expensive um, than certainly than interchange plus. Um, there's less visibility uh, in the sense of, of, you know, what interchange level went to what tier? This was Ali's question earlier. How do you, how do you make that fair and transparent? And then uh, it like, like flat pricing, you do have to think about portfolio management and increasing your, um, your, your pricing uh, uh, at least once a year to account for the increased cost, usually increased cost of interchange. Okay. All right. Let's move. All right, so now I'm gonna kind of wind into the geeky part of this. We gave um, some examples, uh, just these are Visa examples. Uh, we love all our card brands, not one more than others, but this just happened to be a Visa example. And this is a Visa consumer card, a Visa rewards card, a Visa signature card, which is like super rewards, and then a Visa debit card. And on Interchange Plus, you can see you, you're gonna have a different price for each of them. And what we did is we took the price and we expressed it both ways. We expressed it. And this, by the way, this is all just an example of what you might see. This is not, um, it's not supposed to be what, a recommendation of how to price, but you can see you've got um, Interchange Plus, the least expensive is the consumer card. Oh, sorry, the least expensive is debit, but then it, it uh, you know, different cards have different prices. With flat, they're all the same price, typically higher. With tiered, you're going to have just three categories of prices. You've got the 3.7%, you've got the 4.1%, and the 5.1%. I assume if you have questions, you'll ask. All right, I'm going to go through a couple of examples. And this is, this these, almost you can think of like worksheets to look at and make sure you follow what's happening in these examples. Um, but we took... You know, 
kind of real world examples of Scott's Shake Shack. So this is a quick serve restaurant and it's 25 bucks, including tip. So on a Visa Rewards card, what would that be? Oh, by the way, this, this merchant's priced, this restaurant is priced with Interchange Plus pricing and it's a card present transaction. So if the interchange rate is 2.1%, is someone okay? If the interchange rate is two point one percent, and the the interchange plus is interchange plus seventy five basis points and ten cents, you can see that it's the twenty five dollars times the two point one percent. You take that same twenty five dollars times the network fee of fourteen basis points. The network fees also have almost two cents of fees. That's just one of the network fees. The seven cents is the is the processing cost, and then you m add the margin in twenty five dollars times 075 percent, and then finally the ten cents of margin, getting you to ninety three point seven cents, and that margin is consistent because it's interchange plus, and that margin is twenty eight point seven five cents, and the way you can get to that is you take the plus part of the interchange plus, which is 75 basis points and 10 cents. And you multiply the 75 basis points times the $25 ticket. You add 10 cents and you get to 28.75. Of course, with the debit card, the margin is the same because you're paying, paying for the plus, but the total cost is lower because the interchange is significantly lower. And actually the, uh, the uh, network fees are a little bit lower too. If you look at the same thing, but card not present, you'll notice that the, let's see, is it any different? Yeah, it's a little bit more expensive on uh, on the Visa Rewards credit card um, because the it's 2.2% instead of 2.1%. But the debit card's the same price because it's on a, uh, on a regulated debit uh, card, which regulated debit cards because of the bill that we talked about earlier in the, in the webinar, uh, the Durbin Amendment to the Dodd-Frank bill, um, debit cards are regulated and, and the price is fixed. So it doesn't matter if it's card present or card not present if the issuer is over 10 billion in payment in um, assets. All right, are card not present generally more expensive? Yes, generally card present is more expensive, but not always. Um, I mentioned the debit card example. example. A lot of times industries that that live heavily card present like hotel or heavily card not present like hotels, many cases, if you're getting the best hotel interchange rate, it doesn't matter if it's card present or card not present. But if you want to just say in general, certainly retail um, and most of the world, you will have a differential uh, between the card present price and the card not present price. And usually card not present is higher. I don't know of any cases where card not present is less than card present. All right, is that... Okay, answer. So just to go through another couple of examples and then I'll open it up for any other kind of general questions. Let's look at Dave's dentistry, right? So it's a dentist uh, industry. It's a card present transaction. This time it's a MasterCard consumer credit card. So this isn't a rewards card, it's just a basic card. And if you look, there's a $25 copay, but this one is on flat pricing. And this is 3.5% and 30 cents. So Dave is always going to pay a dollar 17 and a half. And the margin, as you can see, higher than the last page, the margin is five, uh, 53, almost 54 cents. For a debit card, price is the same, margin's higher. Interestingly, now let's look at card not present. Now, card not present, the margin's much lower for the provider because they provided this flat amount. And so where they're making more money on card present, they're making less money on card not present. And the retailer has no incentive to uh, make the card present. And in this case, I said retailer, the dentist has no incentive to um, be sure that it's card present. All right, last example, let's talk about a field services transaction. So this is like a, a plumber. Uh, oh, oh, wait, sorry, landscaping, sorry. It's Lauren's Landscaping. And they are using tap to pay with a $25 invoice. So in this case, it's it's a tiered uh, pricing model. And so for tiered, 
you've got to ask yourself, is this a qualified transaction? Well, it's card present and it's a basic credit card with no rewards. And in every uh, tiered scheme I know of, that would be qualified. So they would pay the lowest of the tiers, which is 2.5% in this case and 30 cents. So the rates and fees are 92 and a half cents and the margin is 32.3 cents. But if it's a debit card, the price is the same because that's still qualified. The margin's a lot higher for the provider. But now let's look and see what happens when it's card not present. So now let's go with a card not present. And this time it's a signature preferred. So this is the, the mo one of the most expensive Visa cards. And so that Visa signature preferred is a non-qualified because it's a very expensive card and it's card not present. So this provider has them in the non-qualified bucket. And so it's 3.9% and 30 cents, which comes to $1.27 and a half, which creates a margin of 42 and a half cents, a little more than that. The debit card is less expensive because it's a mid-qualified rate, which is a dollar and two, two and a half cents right? Because it's mid-qualified, which is 2.9% and 30 cents, a full percent less than the Visa Signature Preferred card on the left. However, it's higher margin because debit cards are so inexpensive, especially once you get over a certain average ticket. Okay. So with one, I'm one minute ahead of my goal to be done at 145, well, 145 Mountain and leave a little room for questions. So are there any more general questions or anything anybody wants to address? I don't see any hands up. Okay. Well, I appreciate everyone. Thank you for all the questions that came up during the conversation. Uh, by all means, you know how to hit us up because you're here. Uh, we, uh, I think everybody knows that we launched uh, our PayFAC uh, about uh, six months ago. It's called LaunchPay. Certainly appreciate any questions you have about it. And we can certainly help any of the ISVs out there trying to figure out how to best serve uh, their merchant community. Oh, there's a question. Yay. Why was the interchange for Visa signature preferred lower than the Visa consumer credit card, but it still fell to a none? Uh, I I didn't catch that. I will have to look. Let's see. So you're saying that the Visa interchange, um, that would not be an un, an impossible, an impossibility. Um, but let me see. Let me let's. So you're saying that the Visa signature preferred um, of 1.5, what it's probably, it may have to do with the fact that it is a um, services industry. It may have to do with the fact that it's a small business under 250,000 per year in Visa volume can get the small business um, incentive or the small business uh, uh, bucket to that. Um, and then what's the consumer, uh, it's a consumer card. It looks like the visa consumer is the same interchange rate in this particular case, but the way that that would be due to bucketing. So it looks like the interchange, if I'm, if I'm understanding the question, uh, the anonymous question, the interchange might be the same, but if you want to be transparent about what your bucketing is and you say, all credit cards that have a certain rewards level are going to go in a certain pl place. You may have differences in interchange that don't correlate perfectly with differences in tiers, but then you can better explain why you're doing what you're doing. And that's just a business choice because you do have the freedom to do your tiers differently. Okay. Um, so I got that one and oh, they said, I may have misread it. Sorry. No, I, I don't, I'm not sure it's, it is definitely two different uh, buckets. How would a merchant check that there's no added markup? Um, the best way is to get access. Visa publishes the interchange charts. We have a few open source charts that we've enjoyed using. I don't share those too widely because we like to get to, to know our customers and we use those as, as resources. But there is a ton of information out there and you can 
as I said, Visa, MasterCard published them. There's a lot of stuff on the internet to basically figure out all this stuff. How much is, is this particular transaction um, supposed to be? And then you look and say, does the amount I was charged match that? And then that's how you find out if there was markup. And is it common to see tiered pricing where qualified rates are flat, but not qualified or a percentage, for example? No, I, I don't think I've ever seen that. Um, typically, because all of these different components of pricing are expressed in both a percent and an amount, it is a best practice to always have both. Um, there are times when you might go to just a, a percentage amount or I guess just a flat amount, but you'd better know exactly what you're dealing with in terms of transactions because you could get raked over the coals by an, an undercharge. Um, so I would I would never uh, encourage anyone to go with flat without a percent without a per transaction or a per transaction without a flat uh, without a without a uh, percentage. Okay, we've answered all the ones I'm aware of. I'll give another just a couple minutes. Uh, and if there's more questions, we'll keep going. There's still 35 people on here, so I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a if there's a question to ask. I'm not gonna start telling jokes or we're gonna end up with uh, most of the people leaving. Any of you who know me know my jokes are terrible and all dad jokes. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm at Todd at Infinicept.com. I'm not sure if we have that on here. I'm at Todd at Infinicept.com, LinkedIn. Oh, well, I won't name all the socials, but uh, lots of ways to get in touch with us too. Sokol from Infinicept who helped do this with me is available and um, infinicept.com, launchpay.com. You guys will all get a, a follow-up email. Oh, uh, hold on. I just got a question. Um, can you talk a bit on your payback model? So yes, I'll, I, I'm not too big on commercials, but we will answer the question. So um, we built Infinicept starting with consulting. Uh, we helped launch Stripe and Shopify a long time ago. We realized everyone needed some tools to do things like merchant onboarding, underwriting, reporting, fees, funding, all this sort of messy back office stuff. So we built a software platform to do all that. And after years and billions and billions and billions of dollars processed, our customers, we just had this whole cohort of prospects that said, well, we don't want to learn everything about payments. Like, can you just do the messy part? Teach us how to sell it. Give us the tools to do the stuff, but maybe you guys do the underwriting. Maybe you guys do the the monitoring of merchants, and um, you know we sort of share in the in the servicing in the right way. So we launched LaunchPay to be kind of a path to Payfac, where where the software company or or partner doesn't have to learn everything about payments, can rely on payments experts with hundreds of years of experience in it, and yet be able to sell it, service it, have their branded experience where it's it's the the software company's brand, not Infinisept's brand. So we've signed up thousands of merchants in, in just a short period of time. We've got uh, double digit uh, software partners in all kinds of industries, tax preparation, uh, several restaurant point of sales, medical, uh, you know, property, uh, you know, real estate, lots and lots of verticals. So um, that's, that's what it, LaunchPay does. I hope that's helpful. Is it a rev share model or SaaS? We have both. So if you're, uh, so the question is, is it a rev share model or a SaaS fee? We have uh, a kind of a, a, a volume based model for launch pay typically, where if we're doing all of it and taking the, the liability, um, then we would get uh, margin on transactions, but the majority of it goes to the uh, software company. We get the minority. Um, in, in the, uh, Pay ops, which is our original product, it's just a SaaS fee, and uh, and the payment margin is made by the Payfac, um, and we help we white glove uh, uh, assist with the software company to help you become a Payfac, and a lot of times um, companies that want to become a Payfac and want to get to that SaaS fee model will use LaunchPay just to get there, and all of our LaunchPay customers can move their entire portfolio to their Payfac at the time of their time and place of their choice. 
Uh, that's contractual. It's completely portable and transparent. Um, oh, yeah, you can message me. Okay. All right, so I've got room for questions. If Oh, you're welcome, Robert. Uh, happy to answer the questions. If anyone else has any, um, when does it make sense volume-wise to use launch papers or payback? Great question. Um, I wonder if I, the at anonymous attendee is dishing me easy ones. Um, you know, it, you, I used to say 100 million in payment volume per year. Uh, it, excuse me, it made more sense to be a payback. The pricing on Payfac as a service, which is like LaunchPay, just in the market, I think the pricing has come down some, and I think the quality has gone up some. So I would take a, a LaunchPay or a Payfac as a service model quite a bit larger than I used to think. Um, it depends on your margins in your industry. The, the higher the margins in your industry, the sooner um, you'd want to be a Payfac yourself because you'd want all that, all the, all those uh, great margins for yourself. Um, but somewhere between a couple 300 million and a couple billion, um, depending. And also it just depends on what is the business, what's right for your business. How much do you want to learn about payments? How much, uh, uh, you know, how, how many people do you have that know payments? How hard are your payments? How complex do you want your program? Um, how much of a control freak are you? And how much do you like to just, you know, make mailbox money? So all those things are, are considerations. Okay, well, I'm going to give it till 55. If there's no more questions, we'll say thank you very much. And it's right now, I have it at 154 Colorado time. Any reason why bigger companies don't become Payfax? Um, the biggest reason we saw, and this is why we reacted to our customers, is lots of companies just don't have the confidence in their ability to understand payments, or it's just sounds scary. There's been so much fear, uncertainty, and doubt put out there by um, parties that have a lot to lose um, that some are just scared of it. So we see that all the time. Uh, and we we don't agree. We think it's very doable, but we built LaunchPay to make sure that you can br bridge that gap where a uh, company of any size feels like they they aren't ready. We can help them, and when they are ready, they can they can uh, uh, take that leap themselves with our help. Okay, I've got time for one more question. If there's one more question in the next minute, I'll answer it. Otherwise, we're going to say goodbye. Okay, going once, going twice. Bye, everyone. Bye.